And today's topic is going to be on genetics. Now, because genetics is such a huge topic in life sciences, I've decided to divide the topic of genetics into two sessions. So our first session will be today, part one, and I will indicate to you later which parts of genetics we will tackle today. And then on the 16th of May, we have our genetics part two. So let's get started. Now, genetics and inheritance is one of those topics that was either completed by a teacher or taught to you either at the end of term one or some schools attempted this topic at the beginning of term two. Whichever way, you should have completed the topic of genetics and inheritance by now. You also know by now that this topic will be in paper two. And as you can see, it carries quite a a heavy weight in paper two, 32% of the 150 marks, which is 48 marks, is on genetics. So please try and understand, try and know the basics of genetics that, so that you can attend these questions in your end of the year paper. Please, I want this to be an interactive session. So if you have any questions, please raise your hand or put it in the chat. I'm going to go very slowly because I know learners struggle with this topic. It is a very abstract topic. It's not something in our everyday vocabulary, okay? What knowledge, what prior knowledge were you supposed to know or background knowledge will help you with the understanding of these concepts? Obviously, DNA replication why DNA replication so that the DNA can make a copy of itself so that each cell can have the identical DNA. You should know the basic structure of chromosomes, um, our chromosomes, the structure, what is on the chromosomes, and also your background information on meiosis. And that is why the sequence that we follow in grade 12 from the beginning of the year is DNA replication, then we go on to chromosomes, and then we go on to meiosis, and then we start genetic. Now, any resources, let me just go here, that will assist you with the understanding of this chapter is obviously your textbook, study guides, the diagnostic report, which your teacher should have read, Mind the Gap, and then your past NSC and SC papers. Right. So we continue. What are the key concepts for genetics and inheritance? Now, there are quite a number of concepts that you're going to learn here. Remember, it's the reason why learners struggle with this topic, it's the first time in your FET phase from grade 10, 11, that you are encountering the topic of genetics. And so it is some foreign concepts. So first of all, we're going to look at the different concepts that we use, terminology that we use. We're going to today look at monohybrid crosses. We're going to look at sex determination. And we're going to look at sex-linked inheritance. Then on our, in our session on the 16th of May, we're going to do dihybrid crosses, blood groups, and pedigree diagrams. Right, so we'll continue. Now, here I've made a list of the concepts that you need to know and understand. And I do hope that your teacher has downloaded this material, the study material for you, or printed it if they, that would be even better. But if they couldn't print it, I hope that it is accessible to all our learners. Now, if you look at the basic structure of a cell, and this is what we've done in grade 8, grade 9, and grade 10, we know in our cells we have our nucleus, and in a nucleus, we normally say we have our genetic material. Now, what is our genetic material that we refer to? If we unravel this nucleus, we know our nucleus is made up of chromosomes. And because we are human, we have 46 chromosomes or 23 pairs. 23 from our mom, mother, which we call our maternal chromosomes, and 23 chromosomes from our father, referred to as our paternal chromosomes. So we know the structure of a chromosomes. 
on the chromosomes, you have your genes. And your genes are there, every characteristic in your body, you have a gene for that characteristic. And your gene, if you take your gene and you further unwind your genes, that is where your DNA, you, so your genes are made up of your DNA. So if we define a gene, we can see it's a portion of DNA coding for a particular characteristic. Right, then what do we refer to when we speak of alleles? Now, remember what I said, you get a gene, let's say eye color, for eye color is a characteristic in humans. You'll get a gene from your mother and you will get a gene from your father. Remember what we said? Anything from your mother is maternal and from your father is paternal. So you will have different forms of the same gene. Okay, and the different forms of the same gene are referred to as alleles. So let's say that gene, so you have a gene for eye color. Allele is just the different form of the gene which occur at the same locus. Or this, Remember, what is your locus? Your position on a chromosome where you find your genes. Okay, now remember, Another concept that we're going to hear in genetics is genotype. Can you see where the word geno comes from? From gene. So we are looking at your genetic composition. So if you ask a genotype, we want to know what are the genes of that characteristic, okay? And every gene will have two alleles, different forms, when we speak of pheno, pheno, facial, your phenotype is the physical appearance of an organism. Whether you have blue eyes or brown eyes, whether you're tall, whether you're short, whether your hair is black or blonde, the physical appearance is the phenotype. Right. Now, remember, for every characteristic, we have a gene which consists of two alleles. Now, when we speak of a dominant allele, what is a dominant allele? That is the allele that is expressed in the phenotype, the one that we can see, okay? Now, when we speak, I first probably need to explain heterozygous and homozygous. Let's start with homozygous. Homo meaning the same. Yetro means different. Homozygous means the two alleles for the characteristic is identical. So let's just have a look. We're just randomly going to use T for a tall and small T for short. There you can see big T, big T, homozygous. Small T, small T, homozygous. So the big letter normally indicates the dominant allele. So the dominant allele is always indicated with a capital letter. And by this stage, grade 12, I really want to reassure you that you will always be given the letters for the alleles. In the exam, they will provide you with the letters. So you don't have to make up your own letters, okay? So if I tell you big T indicates a tall plant and small T indicates a short plant, Already you should know if this information was not there, that T, tall, is dominant over short. So dominant, if these two are expressed or together, the dominant allele is always expressed when in the heterozygous state. Okay, Recessive allele, it means that allele that is not shown. We say it is masked. It is covered. It is there, but you cannot see it. So you will still carry an allele, a recessive allele, but you just cannot see it in the phenotype. When in the heterozygous condition. But remember, you can see it if it's in the homozygous condition. I hope this makes sense. I think years we learners, if you do not understand these concepts, then it's very difficult to understand the rest of genetics. So we speak of a gene 
meaning it is DNA coding for a particular characteristic. For every gene, we have different forms of the gene, and those different forms are referred to as alleles. If the two alleles are the same, we say the organism is homozygous. If the two alleles are different, we say the organism is heterozygous. They will indicate you in an exam, we'll see later on in questions, a dominant allele is always indicated with a capital letter and a recessive allele is always indicated with a small letter. So if I have big T, big T in this one, then I know this organism is homozygous dominant. Okay? If I have big T, small t, you will still see the dominant characteristic, but the organism is heterozygous dominant. For the recessive allele to be visible in the phenotype, you must have homozygous recessive, small t, small t. Are there any questions concerning these terminology? Right, we will continue. Um, I'm so sorry, Fairdale, we went through the different terminologies that you need to know, and we've just explained the difference between a gene and an allele, the difference between uh, heterozygous and homozygous, the difference between dominant and recessive, and genotype and phenotype. I really do suggest, um, grade 12s, that at this stage, if you understand these concepts, please make sure you study these concepts. Because if you know these concepts, it makes any um, question on genetics very, very easy to understand. Right. Then what we're also going to look at today is, now, before I continue, remember Gregory Mendel was a scientist that in, not invented, but he was the first to write about genetics, okay? And he did a lot of crosses with plants and stuff. So we're going to look at a monohybrid cross today. What does mono mean? It means one, meaning we are only looking at one characteristic. Remember another name for a characteristic in your notes, characteristic, highlight that or underline that word is also known as a trait. So if you see the word trait, it just refers to a characteristic. So if I only look at one characteristic, like um, black hair compared to blonde hair or black eyes or brown eyes compared to blue eyes. I'm only looking at one characteristic. Then it is referred to as a monohybrid cross. And at grade 12 level, we only do monohybrid and dye, dye meaning two dihybrid crosses, which we'll do on the 16th of May. Right. And what type of, there are three types of monohybrid crosses that you get. So they can give you a cross and then they can ask you, why is it referred to as a monohybrid cross? Then you need to say it is only one characteristic that is shown in the genetic cross. Or they could ask you, what is a, in question 1.2, give the correct term for a genetic cross that involves only one characteristic, then your answer is monohybrid. Right. They can give you a cross and they can ask you the type of dominance that is shown in the cross. So you need to know the difference between complete dominance, incomplete dominance, and co dominance right so if we look at complete dominance in this type of cross the allele so let's check for this example let's use an example flower color so we say flower color example you get yellow flowers or white flowers okay so here we're going to have a look at let's say in this example we're going to look at tall plants and short plants so already you can see tall plants are dominant. Why? Because it has a capital T. Which characteristic is recessive? 
short because it has a small t. The tall is dominant over the allele for short. So all the offspring will be tall, okay? This is very important information because they can tell you a tall plant was crossed with a short plant. What will the um, phenotype be in the offspring? They're always going to have the dominant characteristic, meaning dominant yeah, it masks, it's shown. The recessive is not shown. The dominant characteristic is shown in the first generation. That is complete dominance. Incomplete dominance. Here you have a cross between two phenotypically different parents. But the parents produce an intermediate phenotype. So here I've got red flowers. And I've got white flowers, but red is not dominant over white, or white is not recessive to red, because my flowers that I get are pink. Already that is an indication This none of the characteristics are dominant. That is a incomplete dominance. Co-dominance is a cross in which both alleles are expressed equally in the phenotype. So if I have a red flower plant that crosses with a white flower plant, I get flowers with red and white patches. This is very um, common in our, in our animals. You get dogs where you have dogs with white patches. Are you with me? So white or black is not dominant. Both of them are expressed. So we speak of co-dominance. Multiple, what does multiple mean? Uh, many. It doesn't just have one alleles. So yeah, you have more than two forms of a gene at the same locus. And an example, we're not going to do it today, but in our next um, section on genetics, where we look at blood groups. Right. Six linked characteristics. Those are characteristics that... <laughs> If I can just at this stage ask the schools to mute their microphones. As it indicates here, sex linked, it is carried on the sex chromosomes. And for our purposes, there are many other sex linked characteristics. For our purposes, what we need to know are the only two is hemophilia, where your blood does not clot, and color blindness. Okay, but that for a later stage. Now, remember I spoke of this guy, the scientist called Gregor Mendel. Now, Mendel was the father of inheritance. We call him the father of inheritance because he was the first scientist that actually made laws or principles of inheritance. And he had three laws or principles of inheritance. And you can either refer to it as a law, Mendel's laws, or Mendel's principles of inheritance. Now, what is Mendel's first principle? When we do examples, I'll explain it, but this you need to study. This is just basic concepts. You just need to study it. So the law of segregation. Now, what does segregation mean? To separate. So what, what did Mendel say? Mendel said, an organism possesses two factors. And the reason why, remember at that stage, Mendel didn't know anything about genes and alleles. So he said there are two factors. And now we actually know there are two alleles. And what happens to these two alleles? They separate so that each gamete contains one of the alleles. Okay? So you can either say an organism possesses two alleles. Or because Mendel didn't know at that stage what these factors were, you can also refer to it as the factors. That is Mendel's law of segregation. So when you form gametes, Mendel says, what happens? The two alleles separate and each gamete will have a different allele. Mendel's second law is the law of dominance. He says when two homozygous, now what does homozygous mean? They have the same alleles, are crossed. All the individuals 
in the first generation will display the dominant trait. So if you have big T, big T crossing with small T, small T, by now you should know all the offspring will have the dominant trait tall, but it will be heterozygous for that particular characteristic. And then Mendel's third law is the law of independent assortment. This one I'm not going to touch on now because we're going to do it. This law applies to your dye hybrid crosses. So I will leave that for part two of genetics. But please do me a favor, grade 12s, and study these different is these different laws because you can be asked in the exam and then it carries two to three marks. Right. Next thing, so you need to know your basic concepts that we've done in slide one. You need to know Mendel's laws, and then you need to know the format of a genetic cross. So if you ask, um, show by means of a genetic cross, please know there's a recipe, there's a format. You always start with P1. P1 means it's the parents. So you indicate you're on the left-hand side, P1, and you start with the phenotype. You identify the phenotype. So you'll have the phenotype of the one organism, crosses, we indicate it with an X, and you'll have the phenotype of the second organism. And for that phenotype, indicated correctly, you will get one mark. And there I tell you the phenotype is that that you can see. So if I tell you a tall plant is crossed with a short plant, your phenotype will be tall crosses with short. I hope it makes sense. The, on the second line, you have your genotype. And what is your genotype? your genetic composition for that characteristic. So you need to write down the genes. Does it make sense? And we know a gene consists of how many alleles? Two alleles. So there must be two alleles. You need to understand, is it homozygous or is it heterozygous? Right. Then meiosis takes place and gametes are formed. And what does Mendel's law of segregation say? When gametes are formed, these two alleles will separate. Example, I'm just going to try and write. I write very ugly here. Let's say we're going to use tall. I tell you, a tall plant is crossed with a short plant. But the information that I give you I tell you, in my question, I need to tell you, big T is tall. Small T, and we use the same letter, a short. Already from that information, what do you know? Which characteristic is dominant? Tall. Which characteristic is recessive? Short, right? If I tell you a homozygous tall plant, what does homozygous mean? Both the alleles are the same. So I can't have big T, small t. It's crossed with a short plant. The only genotype that a short plant can have is small t, small t. Because as soon as I put a big T in, it becomes, it gets the dominant characteristic. Because the dominant always masks the recessive gene. What does Mendel say? So there I've got my genotype. When gametes are formed, the two factors or the two alleles separate. So my gamete on that side is T, T. My gamete on this side is T, small t, small t. And if that crosses with that, I can either use a Punnett square as here. I prefer Punnett square because sometimes the lines get mixed up. This one crosses with that one, would give me big T, small t. That one crosses with that one, would give me big T, small t. This one with that one, big T, small t. That one with that Sorry, big T, small t. So I can see all the organisms, all the offspring formed in the first generation. Mendel's law of dominance. 
will have the dominant, they all be tall, but they will be heterozygous tall. If you know this recipe, then please P1 phenotype, write down your phenotype, your genotype, meiosis, gametes, fertilization, F1 genotype, because you get a mark for writing P1 F1 in the correct order. You get a mark for meiosis fertilization, which is already two marks, and any genetic cross will be six marks. So for even if you do not know what's happening in the cross, you can get two out of six for just writing down the correct recipe. Right, let's continue. So we're going to look at a monohybrid cross. And here we are going to look at complete dominance, where the one characteristic masks the other characteristic. So let's read. In pea plants, the allele for green pot, meaning the pots of the peas, this stuff here, and they give you big G as dominant over the allele for yellow pot. So if you cross two homozygous parents, then the phenotype of all the offspring will have green pots. Right? Meaning if I have big G, big G, and I cross it with small G, small G, there's my gametes, big G, big G, small G, small G, they're separated. And there's my offspring in my first generation. All of them, as you can see, will be green. And that I call complete dominance. A cross where the dominant allele blocks the expression of the recessive, uh, I beg your pardon, in the heterozygous state. Right, now we're going to look at an example from the exam. In rabbits, black fur is produced by the allele B. From that information already, which um, allele is dominant? Black fur, okay? White fur by the allele small b. So we know the characteristic that is dominant here is black fur is dominant and white fur is recessive. But now they say the table shows the genotype of some rabbits. So rabbit one, there's the genotype, rabbit two and rabbit three. So this information tells me that rabbit one is how, what is the color of, what's the phenotype? So if I'm a learner, what is the phenotype of rabbit one? It must be black fur because black is dominant. This rabbit is homozygous dominant. Rabbit two, the fur color must be black as well because the dominant allele blocks the recessive allele when in the heterozygous state. Rabbit three, small b, small b, it can only be white fur. So if I'm a learner in the exam, I would write here next to this question, that is, apologies for trying to write here, that is black, that is black, and this one is white. Question one, what is the phenotype? Can you see why I told you this? these terms are important? If you do not know what phenotype means, you are going to struggle. Phenotype meaning that you can see what's visible. What is the phenotype produced by the recessive allele? So what is the examiner testing? Do I know what phenotype means? And do I know what recessive means? Recessive means that allele with the small letter that is mass that you cannot see. So the recessive allele, this one here, what is the phenotype, the expression of that? It is white fur. Does that make sense? What is the phenotype of rabbit two? So if I look, look at rabbit two, and because I was such a good learner and I knew my work, I already wrote there black. So I know it is black. Question 212, give the number only. So they want this number one, two, or three, 
of the rabbits that are pure bread. Now, what does pure bread mean? Pure bread is just another term for homozygous. So if I must give a number of a rabbit that is homozygous, which rabbit, one, two, or three, is homozygous for fur color? Anyone know? Homozygous, what does homozygous mean? Purebred means homozygous. And what does homozygous mean? The two alleles are the same. And in which of the rabbits are the two alleles the same? Those two alleles are the same. Those alleles are different and that's the same. So my answer can only be rabbit one and rabbit three. Give the number of the rabbits that are homozygous dominant. So that's homozygous, but it's homozygous recessive. That is homozygous, but it is homozygous dominant. And my answer can only be rabbit one. And then here we go. Use a genetic cross. Six marks, always for a cross. But what must you show? The percentage chance of rabbits one and three having offspring with white fur. So what should my genetic cross be? It must be with rabbit one and three. And this is a compulsory mark because I must show the percentage chance and we will get to that one now. So let's just look if those answers are correct. There I can see my white fur, my black fur, rabbit two, What's the phenotype of rabbit two is black. The numbers are one and three. And here my number is one. Let's look at my genetic cross and remember my recipe for a genetic cross. There I go. I write down P1 phenotype. And if I just go back one, I just want to go back. Rabbit one was big B. So what's the phenotype of that rabbit is black. So if I go there, it's a black cross with rabbit three white, one mark for that. The genotype I get from the table, rabbit one was big B, big B, rabbit three was small B, small B. My osis takes place, gametes are formed. When gametes are formed, Mendel says these two alleles separate. So I've got big B, big B, small B, small B. I can either cross them like that and I see all my genotypes, there's my genotype one mark, my phenotype, they all black. So what is the percentage chance that they, let's just go to the question, that they will have white fur? Zero percent, because they are all black. So I'm going to get a mark for zero percent. Okay, one mark for P1 and F1, one mark for my osis fertilization, one mark for zero. I hope you could do that example. Any questions on that example? Right. Second example, and this is still complete dominance. In dogs, rough hair, we are looking at the hair of the dog, is dominant to smooth hair. And already they give us the alleles. So I know rough is dominant over smooth. Now, what are they telling us? Let me just go. A heterozygous rough-haired dog. What does heterozygous mean? The two alleles are different. What is the allele for rough? Capital H. But if it's heterozygous, meaning the two alleles are different. That is still heterozygous. Is mated with a smooth haired dog. So this one crosses with a smooth head. It can only be small h, small h. Right. Represent a genetic cross to show the phenotypic ratios of the puppies. So remember, we start with P1 and we always go phenotype. Oh, let's just go there. Let me just, sorry, apologies for this. I just want to erase the ink. P1, my phenotype, rough hair with a smooth hair, one mark. The genotype for rough hair is big H, small H. Reason why? Because it is heterozygous. 
Smooth can only be small h, small h. Meiosis, gametes are formed. They separate. The two alleles separate. There's my gametes. I get a mark. Fertilization takes place. And in the F1 genotype, I have two rough hairs and I have two smooth hairs. So what two to two? If I simplify that ratio, it is one to one. Okay. And if there are any questions, please ask your teacher to assist you, or you can just ask in the chat again. And please remember this recipe, very important. Even if you do not understand the rest of the cross, write down the recipe. You will get two out of your six marks. Right, now we're going to look at incomplete dominance. Do you still remember from our terminology? Can you see why terminology is so important? Incomplete dominance, meaning not one of the two characteristics are dominant. So they two phenotypically different parents producing offspring with an intermediate phenotype. I have flower color here, red color, nor white color is dominant. Now, here I can't use the same. I can't use a small r because then it means it's recessive. So, dub here is in incomplete dominance. We always use two different letters. And that already should give you an indication that we are speaking of incomplete dominance. So, that all the offspring will have an intermediate color. So, if I have big R, big R, I know it will be white. If I have WW, I know it will, sorry, Big R, big R, I know it will be red. The flowers will be red. If I have WW, I know the flower color will be white. If I have RW, I know my flower color will be pink. So that indicates incomplete dominance. Neither of the parents is evident in the offspring. So if I have my gametes for red color, big R, big R, and I have my gametes for white color, W, W, R, W won't give me red or white. It will give me pink, 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 pink. So all the offspring in the F1 generation will have an intermediate color. Then I know we are speaking of incomplete dominance. Here's an example from an exam. We have two rose plants, both with pink flowers. You cross them and find that while most of the offspring are pink, so you get pink, you get red, and you get white. So it's three different colors. Use a genetic cross to show how breeding two pink flowering plants can result in pink, red, and white. Use the letters R for red, W for white. So yeah, they switched you. They've already given you the results. They tell you, when you cross, you get pink, but some are red and some are white. And what must you use? Two pink flowering plants. So if I have pink, cross with pink. From this information given here, what is the genotype for pink? RW crosses with RW. Remember, I'm not, I'm going to show you the proper cross now. What would be my gametes on this side? They just separate on this side. I hope you guys don't write as ugly as I'm writing. So there, that you know will be red flowers. That one will there will give you pink flowers. This one there, RW will give you pink flowers. Sorry. That must be a P, and that one will give you white flowers. So they say, so you get red, pink, pink, and white flowers. And that is what you need to show. Let me just go here and remove my ugly scribbling here and show you the answer. So if I use a pink and a pink, which is RW, RW, I hope you know why we're using RW for pink. There's my gametes. Those two separate, so I get red, 
pink and white flowers. So I can either do it like that, or I can use a Punnett square. This is just an alternative answer if you use the Punnett square. And it's six easy marks. So can you see, by just understanding your basic terminology, what dominant is, what heterozygous means, and reading your information, you can score easy marks. And in every exam, there will be a genetic cross. But your genetic cross could either be complete dominance, or it can be incomplete dominance, or it can be co-dominance. So now, next example. A species of fish has three phenotypes. Already there I have my clue. If I have three phenotypes, meaning not one of the phenotypes is dominant, already a bell should ring. This is incomplete dominance. For finling, so you get elongated fins, meaning long fins, you get short fins, and you get medium fins. Heterozygous fish have medium fins. And they tell me, remember I said you don't have to use your own um, letters. They tell me the carrot is under the control of this one gene controlling fin length. And there are two alleles. E, big E is an elongated. And short, uh, sorry, is S, big S is short fins. So already I know to get a medium fin, it's going to be big N, a big E, and an S. Big E, big E will give me uh, elongated fins. Big S, big S will give me short fins. And big E, big S will give me medium fins. Name, now yeah, a double banger. You need to name the type of dominance and describe the type of dominance. Three easy marks. What type of dominance do I have here? Not one of the characteristics is dominant over the other, and you have an intermediate. That means it's incomplete dominance. And then you just need to say what incomplete dominance is. And if you go back to our, there it is, it's a cross between two phenotypically different parents that produce offspring with an intermediate phenotype. So that would be for two marks, naming that. And then you need to show, let's just go and have a look at this one. So it's incomplete dominance, one mark. Neither of the alleles, so not E or S, is dominant, leading to an intermediate phenotype or an offspring with medium fins, two easy marks. The second part of the question was, use a genetic cross. And what must you show? The percentage chance of two fish with medium fins having offspring with short fins. What's your recipe for a genetic cross? P1 phenotype, write down the phenotype, write down the genotype. Meiosis takes place, it forms gametes. Fertilization takes place, my gametes fuse, and I get my genotype and my phenotype. Let's have a look at that one. So two medium fins, so P1 phenotype, medium fin with medium fin. The genotype for medium fin is ES. ES, meiosis takes place. Gametes are formed. There's my gametes ES on that side. ES, and I just cross my gametes, big E with big E. ES, ES, and ES. So yeah, I can see fertilization took place. And what is my genotype? This one would have elongated fins. This one would have medium fins. This one would have medium fins. And this one would be short fins. So they want to know the percentage that they will have short fins. So one out of four, which is 25%, will have short fins. 50% would have medium fins and 25% elongated fins. Right. And then you get the or, either the Punnett square or you could use the lines. Whatever's easy for you, okay, you use that. I hope that one made sense. Then co-dominance. Remember, we are just doing monohybrid cross. What does mono mean? We are only looking at one characteristic. And in your monohybrid cross, you get complete dominance, where one characteristic 
totally blocks or masks the other characteristic when in the heterozygous state, you get incomplete dominance where neither of the two characteristics are dominant and you get an intermediate phenotype. And then you get co-dominance where both characteristics are equally expressed in the phenotype. So both alleles, here I have red flowers and white flowers. Red, genotype R, white, WW. So if those two are combined, I get flower with red and white color. Okay. So they tell you here, so how are you going to know it's not pink? A plant with white flowers, so there's my plant with the white, was crossed with a plant with red flowers. There's my plant with the red flowers. There's my genotype for the red flowers. There's my genotype for the white. But they had equal distribution of red and white color. So there was no intermediate color. Meaning as soon as you had RW, you had a plant that had white and red mixed, okay? Represent a genetic cross, and there is my genetic cross, and that is co-dominance. The word co meaning together. So both alleles are equally expressed in the phenotype. You can see both alleles. You're going to see red, and you're going to see white. You're not going to get pink. As soon as you get pink, it becomes incomplete dominance. Right. I hope we understood our monohybrid crosses. We're going to go on to sex determination. Now, remember, in meiosis, we said meiosis takes place to form our gametes. Meiosis takes place in the male, in our testes, to form our sperm cell. And meiosis takes place in the females, in our ovaries to form our ova or our egg cells. Right. Now, when, a, when a reproduction takes place between a male and a female, a sperm cell fuses with an egg cell. And remember, my sperm cell, we know from my osis, has 23 chromosomes. And it fuses with an egg cell that has 23 chromosomes to form a zygote of 46 chromosomes. And that is the reason why meiosis takes place, to prevent the doubling effect, okay? Because if a, so it only, meiosis only takes place to form our gametes. Because if our gametes had 46 chromosomes, we would actually have a doubling effect. Then you'd have 92 chromosomes, and then you are not human anymore. Right, now if we look at sex determination, what normally happens is that we, our chromosomes are arranged in pairs. If we take a karyotype, now what is a karyotype? A karyotype means it's a diagrammatic representation. I can map out all the chromosomes. And it's normally done uh, during a procedure where amniotic fluid is taken and you can, and the gynecologist or the doctor can actually map out your chromosomes. And from your chromosomes, your chromosomes are arranged in pairs from 1 to 23. And they are arranged in homologous pairs, meaning one chromosome is maternal and one is paternal from the father for the same characteristic. So you will have chromosome 1 to chromosome 23. They're not numbered here, but normally on a karyotype, they will be numbered. So if they ask you in the exam, Give the correct biological term for a diagrammatic representation where chromosomes are arranged from in pairs. It, it is a karyotype. Now, what is a karyotype? What's the information that I can get from a karyotype? The first thing is you count the number of chromosomes. So in this case, I've got chromosome pair 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. So I have 23 pairs, meaning this individual has 46 chromosomes. So it is a normal karyotype of a human. Why? It has 46 chromosomes or 23 pairs. Now, our chromosomes are arranged in homologous chromosomes, meaning homologous, they're the same size, 
they're the same shape and they carry genes at the same locus. So let's say the gene for eye color is there, then the gene for eye color will be there. Now the first 22 pairs of chromosomes, one to 22, is referred to as autosomes. So in a human, if you are given a karyotype, first question they could ask you, how many chromosomes are present in this organism? You are, you're gonna count it and you're going to say 23 pairs or you could say 46 chromosomes. Or they could ask you, why does this karyotype represent a human? It has 46 chromosomes. What do we call chromosomes 1 to 22? Autosomes. Or they could ask you, how many autosomes are represented in this karyotype? Then my autosomes will be 44 or 22 pairs. The last pair of chromosomes. Chromosome pair number 23 is referred to as my sex chromosomes. It indicates the sex of the child. Now, yeah, you can see, if you look at the chromosome now, they're not the same size. I have a large chromosome X and a small chromosome Y. And I know if I have XY, it indicates male. And this side, my sex chromosomes are XX, so this will indicate a female carrier type. So just remember, what do I call this representation? They can give you a diagram like this and say, what is this diagram called? It's called a carrier type. How many chromosomes are present in this? Yeah, I can see it's 23 pairs or 46 chromosomes. How many autosomes? So you need to know your autosomes are your normal body chromosomes. 22 pairs or 44. How many sex chromosomes? There's two. Does this karyotype represent a male or a female? I'm talking about the one on the left. It is male. You always hear. And if they ask why does it represent male, you can say because the gonosomes or the sex chromosomes are XY or it is one big chromosome and one small one. Right. Let's have a look at a question. So let's just go back. Please make sure that you know what a karyotype is. You know what autosomes are. Gonosomes are your sex chromosomes. If it's XY, it's male. If it's XX, it's female. If they do not indicate XY there, you look at the size of the chromosomes. If it's one big, one small, it is male. If it's two of the same size, it is female. Right. Let's have a look at an exam question. The diagram represents the chromosomes from the human somatic cells of two individuals, and these individuals are twins. So a karyotype was done. They want to know what are somatic cells. So this comes from my osis. Remember, you get your normal body cells, which we call somatic cells, and then you get your sex cells that we call our gametes. So what are somatic cells? One mark, our normal body cells. Name the specific type of chromosomes numbered 1 to 22. The first 22 pairs, we just did it now, before that, are referred to as my autosomes. Each of the pairs shown is a homologous pair of chromosomes. So there you can see chromosome, um, let's look at chromosome pair one. Those two are exactly the same size, they're the same shape, and they carry genes for the same character, RISTI. Um, State the origin, Me, origin mean where does it come from, of each chromosome in a homologous pair. One chromosome comes from the mother, so you can say it's maternal, and the other chromosome comes from the father, or you could say it is paternal. Let's three characteristics that chromosomes in a homologous pair have in common. What are the characteristics? They're the same size, they're the same shape, and they carry genes for the same characteristic at the same locus. But it doesn't mean they have exactly, they're not genetically identical. 
because this one might have a dominant allele for eye color and this one might have a recessive allele. So all you have to say is they carry the same gene at the same locus for the same characteristic. Explain. Explain means you need to give a reason why these two individuals, one and two, are not identical twins. So if you look at individual one, is individual one a male or a female? Look at chromosome number 23, big and small, and we said then it must be male. If you look at individual two, chromosomes, gonosomes are the same size, so those are female. And we know identical twins have exactly the same. So they, so you can say one reason why they are not identical twins, the sex chromosomes of, are different. In individual one, the sex chromosomes are XY, which indicates male. And in individual two, the sex chromosomes are XX, which indicates a female. Another question from an exam. The karyotype represents chromosomes of a person. So the first thing you do in a karyotype, let me give you a hint. You look, okay, there's 23, so I know it is human. You go to chromosome pair number 21, you check if it has two chromosomes. Because later on, remember, we did Down syndrome during meiosis, and Down syndrome is only indicated on chromosome pair 21. So if there's two chromosomes, you know this is a, no, a, a normal human. You also go look at chromosome 23. You identify whether it's male or female. And because the two chromosomes have the same size, this must be female. Right. So now you've got that information. Look at the question. Give the collective term. What do we call? Collective term means what do we call the chromosomes 1 to 22? Very easy. We had it previously. Autosomes. State the gender of this person. What is the sex of this person? The gender, it is female. It's one mark, female. But now they ask you, Give one observable reason for your answer there. Why did you say it was female? It is female because the sex chromosomes, or you could say the gonosomes, are the same size, or you could say the gonosomes are XX, or the sex chromosomes are XX. State Mendel's law of Mendel's principle of segregation, two marks. Remember what did Mendel say? When gametes are formed, the two alleles separate during meiosis so that each gamete will have a different allele. Now they ask you, describe, not explain, how the karyotype of a person with Down syndrome would differ from the one above. So this one is normal. Why? Chromosome pair 21 has two chromosomes. In a person with Down syndrome, chromosome, you must say, you can't just say it as 47. Chromosome pair 21 has three chromosomes. Right. They could also ask you to show by means of a genetic cross the inheritance of sex. Now, remember later on, some of you have done it already or some of you are going to do it later on, human reproduction. Just one hint. Whenever um, fertilization takes place between males and females, because all the egg cells are females, females only carry X, X, X egg cells. So the egg cells are all X. Male sperm can be X or Y. And therefore, the sex chromosomes of female is always XX. And sex chromosomes of males is XY. So males determine the gender of the baby. If an X sperm fuses with an X cell, which is, sorry, an egg cell, the baby will be female. If a Y sperm fuses with an egg cell, the baby will be male. 
So the female does not determine the gender of the um, offspring or the baby. It is determined by the male, whether it is an X or a Y sperm. So if you must use a genetic cross to show the inheritance of sex, what, what's my link there? Genetic cross. What's my recipe for genetic cross? P1 phenotype, male crosses with female, one mark. Genotype, what's the genotype of a male? Always XY. What's the genotype of a female? XX. My osis takes place and what is formed? My gametes. And Mendel says when during gamete formation, the two alleles separate. So there's the one gamete, there's the other one. On this side, the same. XX. And if I cross them, XX, XX. X, Y. So there you can see my genotype is two females, two males, meaning I'll always have 50% female and 50% male. So the chance of the baby being male or female is always 50%, ratio one to one. They could ask it as a multiple choice. They could ask, what is the chance of a baby being Female or male, it's always 50%. This comes from past exam papers, two different papers. The first one, use a genetic cross. There we go. As soon as you see genetic cross, it should just, your pen should just go onto that paper. And we start with P1, phenotype. How gender in human is determined by sex chromosomes. So I know I need to start with P1, phenotype, male, I get male. I'm not going to write out now. And I get female. What's my next step in my, in my genetic cross? Genotype. What's the genotype for male? X, Y. What's my genotype for female? X, X. Uh, my osis takes place. What is formed? Gametes. These two separate. So my gametes on that side is X, Y. My gametes here are X, X. If I cross that with that, I get X, 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 Y, X, Y. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Y, X, X. So it's 50% female, 50% male. So my first generation my genotype will always be the same. Remember the recipe. If I look at this question, Lindiwe has two sons and she's now pregnant for the third time. So now Lindiwe is now tired of boys and Lindiwe wants a girl. We know what's the chance of her getting a girl? 50%. Use a genetic cross to show the percentage chance that this child would be a boy. We know if this was a short question, there's a 50% chance. And there we go. There's our recipe, male, female. So use a genetic cross. Once again, you're going to use a genetic cross. But here you get an extra mark for the percentage chance. What's the percentage chance? 50% that it will be male and 50% that it will be female. That would be a compulsory mark. Grade 12, you're rather quiet. Are you still there? Are you still with me? Can I just get an indication? Just wave your hand like you just don't care. Thank you very much. Someone raised their hand, so I'm not speaking to myself. Are we still okay with genetics? Are we looking forward to answering questions on genetics? Let's continue. The last part for this afternoon, remember I mentioned right at the beginning that genetics is quite a big topic. It is like 48 marks. And to fit genetics into one afternoon session is going to be ridiculous and overwhelming. So in our next session on the 16th of May, we will continue with genetics part two. And there we're going to look, remember this afternoon, we looked at monohybrid crosses. There we're going to look at dihybrid crosses. We're going to look at blood groups and we're going to look at pedigree 
diagrams, okay? So don't think, wow, this is all I need to know. This is just the first part of genetics. But I thought it wise to rather separate it. Otherwise, it should have been information overload. The thing is with genetics, you need to practice, 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 practice. First thing you need to do, remember what I said? Please ensure that you know your basic terminology. We will go through it again. Make sure you know Mendel's laws, the three laws. We will go through that again. Make sure you know the recipe for a moan. You will never in the exam be asked to do a complete dihybrid cross. Okay, you will ask gametes or phenotype and genotype from a dihybrid cross, but you will be asked to do a genetic cross. Know the recipe for a genetic cross. Make sure you know your karyotypes, what autosomes and gonosomes are, what, but we'll go through that now when we wrap up. Right. Sex-linked inheritance. Remember, inheritance or genetics just means those characteristics that I inherit from my parents. I get characteristics from my father through the sperm cell. I get characteristics from my mom through the egg cell. And depending on which one is in my DNA, that is the characteristic that would come. So sex linked, meaning it is linked to my sex cells. And I know my sex cells are my gonosomes, which is if I'm female, my gonosomes are XX. If I'm male, my gonosomes are XY. So what is sex-linked inheritance? It is a genetic disorder caused by genes located in the sex chromosome. They will tell you, sometimes learners make the mistake of thinking it is a sex link. They will tell you, right? So if I have a genetic disorder linked to the genes in my sex chromosomes, it is sex link. In humans, my sex chromosomes, we've already done this in the previous one, are my X chromosome and my Y chromosome. A female has two X chromosomes, XX, we know that. And a male has one X chromosome and one Y chromosome. Since the X chromosome carries more genes, remember from our karyotype, we could clearly see that my X chromosomes are larger than my Y chromosome, meaning they carry more genes. There are more genes present on my X chromosomes that are not found on the Y chromosome. The X chromosome is more commonly linked to genetic mutations and disorders. This is a very important fact. NB, notabili. They could ask you, why are um, certain disorders linked, sex linked? Are you with me? And you could say, and why is it the X chromosome that is affected? So your Y chromosome is not really affected by sex link. It's more your X chromosome. Why? They have, they larger, so they have more genes, okay? And it's easy for genetic mutations. Mutation is just a change either in the order of the um, nucleotides. Usually the X-linked traits are expressed more in males. Why is it more in males? Why do I get uh, sex-linked disorders more in males? This is also a very common question in the exam. Why is it more common in males than in females? Why? And the, yes, your answer, males have only one copy of the X chromosome. So if that um, this order is linked to the X chromosomes. Males will have it. A typical example of a genetic disorder is hemophilia, okay, which we know where the blood does not clot, and color blindness. Those are the two genetic disorders that you must know. So first of all, let's just try and get our heads around this. If the genetic disorder is linked to the sex chromosome, we call it a sex-linked disorder. The two sex-linked disorders for you in grade 12 is hemophilia and color blindness. Okay. In humans, we know our sex chromosomes are chromosome pair number 23, which is my X and my Y. 
A female has two X chromosomes. Males have one X chromosome and a Y chromosome. Why are genetic disorders more common in males than in females? Because males only have one X chromosome. So if they have the allele for that disorder, they will have the disorder. Females have two um, X chromosomes. So both X chromosomes must be affected for them to have it. Let's have a look at an example. Here we see hemophilia, and they tell us is a sex linked disease caused by the presence of a recessive allele meaning on the X chromosome. If you have a small H on the X chromosome, you will have hemophilia. Right. And we know hemophilia is a disease where your blood does prevents the blood from clotting. So now they say a normal father. So what is the genotype of the father? Father is male, so we know his genotype is XY. For him to have the allele, are you with me? If I, if I put a small H there, meaning the father has hemophilia. If the father is normal, meaning he will have a big H. A father that has hemophilia will have a small H. So a normal father, that's his genotype. And a heterozygous mother. Now, we know mother is female, so she has two X chromosome. Heterozygous, what does that term mean? The two alleles are different, meaning she has a big H and a small H. So these two marry and they have children. Construct a genetic cross. There it comes again to determine the possible genotypes. So very important. This is very important. Remember when you answer this question, it's important to identify the letters used to indicate the recessive and the dominant alleles. And we know big H is the, sorry, is the dominant and that small H is the recessive. So P1, genetic cross, my recipe, phenotype, we said it's a normal father. We can't just say father because is the father affected or not? So you say normal father crosses with normal mother. The genotype for a normal father, XY with a big H because if he had a small H, you would have been a hemophilic father. Normal mother, but they say she's heterozygous, so she must have big H, small H. She can't be big H, big H, because then she's homozygous. Okay, another mark. Meiosis takes place and my gametes are formed. So what are the gametes on that side? Remember what Mendel says, the two alleles separate, so it's X, big H, Y. Females gametes, X, H, X, small H. And if you cross that, that's the genotype that I get. This genotype, will it be hemophilic? Will it be male or female, first of all? It would be female. Will it be normal or not? It will be a normal female. This would be male, and it would be normal. This one would be female, and it will be normal, because it's heterozygous. The dominant allele blocks the recessive allele. This one would be male, and it will be hemophilic. So I know I can get one person. So there's my genotype, 50% normal female, 25% normal male, and 25% affected male. Right, let's just have a look at some of these multiple choice questions. Now I'm going to, I'm gonna read it with you and I'm gonna wait for an answer. They say, when an individual the individual is homozygous dominant. First of all, you must know what homozygous means. The two alleles are the same. Dominant meaning they both have the same letter. So let's just say homozygous anything, big T, big T. For a cross with an individual that is homozygous recessive, what does Mendel say? This is actually Mendel's law of dominance. If two homozygous individuals are crossed with each other, what did Mendel say? 
all the offspring will have the dominant characteristic, but in the heterozygous state. So let's see, will they be homozygous dominant? No. So that one crosses with a small t, small t, meaning all the offspring will be that. Will it be homozygous? No. Will it be homozygous recessive? No. Will it be purebred homozygous? So my only answer here is answer number C. Okay. A genetic cross where both alleles are equally dominant. Remember, I said your basic terminology is important. So we know it's a cross. What type of monohybrid cross is it? Both alleles are equally dominant. So there's no intermediate. Both are dominant, meaning is it uh, dihybrid? No. Is it incomplete dominance or is it complete dominance? No, it's not complete dominance. Uh, is it a dihybrid? No, because it's only one example. Is it co-dominance or incomplete? Now I'm, I'm stuck between these two, A and C. What does co-dominance mean? Co-dominance means um, both of them are visible in the heterozygous state. Incomplete means an intermediate is formed. So my answer can only be A. Yeah, I have two red-eyed flies were mated and they produce 150 flies. Red eyes and 48, 150 flies with red eyes and 48 flies with white eyes. What does that tell me immediately? That red eye is dominant. From this information, we can reasonably conclude that red eye is dominant and both parents are homozygous or red eye is recessive. It's not recessive. So that one we know is not. White eye is recessive. No, yes, white eye and both parents are heterozygous, meaning, remember, we can't say both are homozygous because then all the flies would have had would have had red eyes so it cannot be where are we now it cannot be b so it's either white is recessive and both are homozygous no so it can only be a can you see how we do multiple choice by eliminating which one of the following monohybrid crosses will result in a phenotypic ratio of one to one and this one I'm going to leave to you to complete because we have exactly 10 minutes left and I want to give you a little test. And let's go. You need to give your teacher on Thursday when you come back. You've got tomorrow Freedom Day to think about the fourth one, the answer, and you will give it to your teacher. Oh, sorry, yes, more. Which one of the following is the genotype of a person with hemophilia? So will this person have hemophilia? No. Why? Because there's a dominant. So that one will block that one. So that is normal. Yeah, I have a male. Will this person have it? No. Will this person have it? No. So the only person that can have hemophilia here is person D. I hope that one was obvious. Color blindness is a disorder caused by a recessive allele on the X chromosome meaning a small letter, which one of the following type is a genotype of a colorblind person? Same applies. If I have big D, uh, that mask, that means I can see normal. That would be normal. That would be normal. That would be normal. So it can only be D. Oh, that was obvious to you. And then I'm going to quickly go into our test. You have 10 biological terms. I want you to complete those 10 quickly. I'm giving you five minutes and then we will mark it. Everything here is what we have spoken about this afternoon, about the basic concepts that you need to know for genetics. Remember, genetics is 48 marks out of your 150 marks. If you can at least get 20 to 30 of those marks, 
you already have a chance of passing paper two. And remember, you still have DNA, you have meiosis, you have evolution. So you can do well. There is no reason for you to fail life sciences. You need to know your basic terminology. So let's go. First one that has it can raise their hand. So as soon as you're done with the 10 terms, please raise your hand so I can see who's done. So what do we call an allele? that is not expressed in the phenotype when found in the heterozygous condition. Yet, what? So I start from the back. What does heterozygous mean? The two alleles are different, right? So if I have two alleles that are different, that's my heterozygous. So the one that is not shown in the phenotype, this one, what do I call that allele? And my correct answer would be, recessive you mark your own work those that got recessive correct kudos to you right let's go to the second one a disorder where blood fails to clot that should be fresh in your brain that was the last part of genetics and what disorder remember in grade 12 the disorders that you need to know is down syndrome hemophilia, and color blindness. All the other disorders, they will give you background information. So in this instance, it is hemophilia. My writing is dismal, so just make sure you get the spelling correct. Now I want two or more alternative forms of a gene. Remember, what a, for every characteristic, there's a gene. And what do I call the alternative forms of a gene? At the same locus, I refer to them as alleles. If you've got alleles, well done. Chromosomes involved in sex determination. You're not going to write chromosome pair 23. They want to know what do I call the chromosomes. And what do I call the chromosomes? Go no zones compared to my autosomes. The type of inheritance. Now remember, type of inheritance, there are three types. Complete dominance, incomplete dominance, co-dominance. Where both alleles are expressed equally, meaning both can be seen, so it is co they together, co-dominance. Next one, an individual having two non-identical alleles, meaning the alleles are different, they're not the same. If I have non-identical alleles, I am referred to as a yetrozygous. Oh, I write like... A grade R. What do I call the non-sex chromosomes? This is the opposite of that one. The non-sex chromosomes are referred to as autosomes. The pair of chromosomes in an organism that has, they've got the same size, same shape, and controls the same characteristics, they are homologous. So from this information, if they ask me what are homologous chromosomes or the characteristics of homologous chromosomes, same size, same shape, controls the same set of characteristics. A genetic cross involving one gene. Where are we now? Sorry, I have this bar going across from me. We just go to my last page. A genetic cross in one gene and its alleles, that would be a monohybrid cross. It's just one gene. And the study of heredity and variation in organisms. What is this topic on? Genetics. Is there anyone in any school that got 10 out of 10? Well done to those that got 10 out of 10. As I say, there's no name and shame. If you got one out of 10, the session was successful for you. You've learned one thing today. Grade 12s, mothers, thanks for joining us during the session.